everybody, and welcome back to the Moving Pictures Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Holtzclaw, and I am back for another episode that might look a little bit different than the rest. Today, I am going to be talking about early 2000s romantic comedy films. So, kind of the Y2K romantic comedy as a genre, and I'll talk about specific movies within that. But I am not focusing on one specific movie because, of course, I couldn't choose which ones to talk about. I love them all. I am a big rom-com consumer. And I think this one is just going to be good, okay? I I took a little break last week, kind of, because I was on vacation with my family. And the week before that, I was sick and there was no way I could actually focus on anything else but how in pain I was. So... Here we are. We're just going to try it again. Um, We are going to be talking about Y2K rom-coms. So let's just dive right in. These rom-coms have typically been labeled as unimportant films, fluffy, um, inconsequential, what I like to call brain candy because it's not like brain food that, that feeds thought and reflection and intellectual discussion as much as certain other films do. But I don't think this is as brain candy as like The Avengers, which has absolutely no message that could relate to us, in my opinion. Like, Doctor Strange just came out. There's absolutely nothing that I could take back into my real life from that movie that would be important. That's brain candy, in my mind. Um, Rom-coms, I would say, are brain candy until you think about it from a more societal standpoint of what is the message of relationships, specifically how most of these uh, romantic comedy films only have heteronormative, heterosexual couples, um, and they don't really branch out to any new standard of practices when it comes to love and romance in our society. I I just wouldn't say that the early 2000s was super indicative of a progressive standpoint on love and relationships and marriage and family, etc. So anyway, all that to say, some things could be problematic if you think about them from a, a societal standard in real life compared to the message that they're sending. These movies really pull at the emotional heartstrings. It's really great highs and really low lows that keep you captivated. Um, These make you want to believe in love or be in love or to have the love you already have be even more (laughs) dramatic, in my opinion. You know, like, I don't know, just with all the grand gestures that come in in these films, I think that can translate to your real life of being like, well, I want my partner to do that or I want someone that will be my partner to do that, etc. And these films also ultimately want to make you live happily ever after. Even though that's not how the real world works, that is why romantic comedies are so important because they make us feel like we can have a fairy tale ending um, in almost any kind of plot, situation, like lifestyle that we're in because The plots are so vast. They generally stick to the same kind of formula, but the plots vary greatly. I mean, think about how many romantic comedies there are. Similar, but different, all of them. So the definition of romantic comedies is a movie or play that deals with love in a light, humorous way. Romance and comedy, there you go. And the summary of what these films are is kind of, the formula. Two people meet, they have a conflict in their way, and then they reunite to live happily ever after, ultimately conquering this conflict. Now to dive into the history, it really all started at the beginning of art with William Shakespeare. Like think about Much Ado About Nothing, Midsummer's Night Dream, the same concept, the same theme, boy meets girl, girl meets boy, conflict, they overcome it, and they live happily ever after because they're in love. Love conquers all in these films, okay? If you didn't already know that. But it is really hard to decisively identify what the first true romantic comedy was, because early on, even like in the silent era, 
there were films called comedies of manners and these were basically the early equivalent of rom-coms this was when a rich person would find love with a non-wealthy person think pretty woman that's exactly what silent film romantic comedies were about these early silent films really wanted to discuss love in their society and within their society wealth had a lot to do with love and who you married and kind of the the normal view of love but this this kind of like full-on romance in art kind of started in the 1930s to tell depression era audiences that money doesn't buy everything and that there's hope found in love relationships with others love slash relationships with others so again this message is like let's talk about how love in our society can be translated to real life if that makes sense like they wanted to appeal to audiences and in society wealth was you know a big deciding factor of of your love life and i think that's kind of where we where we started off with this whole notion of a romantic comedy and why we consume it so easily so often so admirably is because the whole concept is let's reflect ideal love for the society that's watching it. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? It's Cinco de Mayo when I'm recording this and I may have had a margarita so I don't really know if I'm making that much sense but I, I feel like I am. If I'm not just bear with me guys I'll, I'll get through it. <laughs> um, anyway so 30s and 40s they really witnessed the advent of the screwball comedy which is kind of like just like super silly comedy. It's way more exaggerated. This was really big in silent era because there was no sound, obviously. So they had to be really animated and explain the process of the story either with title cards, so like dialogue, dialogue written on the screen, or really big movements. And so near the 40s, this screwball comedy was coming about even more so in this romantic comedy genre as sound was being added to film. So now they could fit the verbal dialogue, wit, smarts, charm, all of that into the visual storytelling that the directors were doing. So now this romantic comedy was really heightening the romance and the comedy and sound all at the same time. And I think this is kind of where, you know, people started to fall in love with it. Um, they were putting romance into these screwball comedies that everyone was kind of used to, but now there was this romantic aspect of it that pulled in even more audiences and this led to the sex comedy which kind of spanned between the 50s to the early 70s and it focused heavily on the differences between men and women so think like when Harry met Sally basically the entire message is that men and women can't just be friends if they want to sleep together like if they're at all attracted to each other they can't just be friends and this was kind of a, a big theme at this time like sex comedy was saying hey let's heighten this romance but also let's add in societal differences sexual differences bio biological differences in men and women and then we can add you know the comedy and the romance easily into that it really brought sex specifically into the equation you know men and women loving dating etc sex was obviously going to come up and so this really changed film in the way that sex wasn't super super common to be shown on screen and it drew an immediate parallel to what was happening in real life which was the sexual liberation movement and so again these movies are just trying to reflect the audiences that are watching and really draw them in in every way that they can but I I think the most common ground for them to bring everybody in is I mean, I guess there's two ways, romance and comedy. But when you put them together, you're, you're really, you know, widening your net for audiences. And I think that's why it was a really good movement in film. It was, it was, it was very successful, I would say. Also in sex comedy, conflict began with two professional rivals, usually. And so this, interestingly enough, started kind of like the enemies to lovers 
theme motif whatever you want to call it that is so often in romantic comedies because in these films they would professionally create conflict between these these rivals create competition and pit these two against each other this man and this woman which eventually led to sparks flying between the two of them and ultimately love that's still a very big theme I mean that's kind of like the tale as old as time enemies to lovers right like think the ugly truth 27 dresses both with Katherine Heigl it's like I feel like that's her specialty to like be really pissy and like hate this guy and then magically fall in love with him by the end and just be like super upset the whole movie but anyway 10 things I hate about you iconic that's technically an 80s 90s movie but I mean you get the gist right the proposal this is the proposal is the epitome of what a sex comedy was two professionals competing kind of rivals in a way and then they fall in love that's literally the plot of the proposal and think a walk to remember which I will discuss later that was the first movie I ever cried to I mean it kind of scarred me but you know it's a good one um so then coming out of kind of like mid 70s the neo-traditional romantic comedy comes about which is the opposite of the radical rom-com because they focus on compatibility and de-emphasize sex so this was kind of going against what had just happened the sex comedy and was saying let's talk more about relationships and love and emotions rather than sex and and sparks and chemistry and all that so here the love is transparent and they both make the relationship work so it's not just one wanting it and the other not there's no really competition here it's kind of like you just see this romance start to bloom equally in both men and women so think Sleepless in Seattle. And then you can even think Trainwreck, the 2015 one with um, Amy Schumer. Because, like, she and the guy that she ends up with, they kind of, like, mutually discover their interest in each other. And it's not like one is pursuing more than the other. And it's really funny because multiple articles mentioned that film when I was looking this up and doing my research. So it's interesting to think that even you know, now modern films and past the 90s and obviously past the 70s, this is still happening. This is still a theme. And it, I mean, it's very popular too. Like Trainwreck, I would say, is more of a comedy than like a, than a straight romantic comedy, but obviously there's romance in it. I just think of it more as like a comedy because I think Amy Schumer is in it and she's a comedian. I don't know. I'm just talking out loud. But no matter what the film is called, what it's defined by, it's all about love. So in 2009, seven of the 50 highest grossing films in North America were some kind of rom-com. And this is because I think, you know, the 80s and 90s became a staple for romantic comedies that led into these amazing two, early 2000s films. I mean, I was trying to look up, you know, the most popular movies from 2000 to 2010, and really... The biggest chunk of romantic comedies came from 2000 to 2005. The, I mean, the ones that I'm familiar with and, and that I watch frequently and that I know a lot of my friends have seen and are just kind of praised, I guess. And it's really interesting because I think it was around 2005, 2006, where the rom-com was getting kind of old. And I think that's because... You know, although rom-coms hit their stride in the early 2000s, this Y2K era, I do think that they're kind of the most iconic because people before it were figuring out what to do, how to like how to craft this the best rom-com that they can. And then after, I'll be generous, after 2009, I think it kind of falls flat. We don't have that many really recent rom-coms that are like, not as iconic as you would think of Legally Blonde, Mean Girls, um, Freaky Friday, 13 Going on 30, uh, The Devil Wears Prada, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Like these to me are staple films that every teenage to adult woman has to watch. And that's my opinion, obviously, but I mean, those are like the amazing movies that I watch with my family when like we can't decide on anything else and we're like oh we'll just watch a feel-good movie 
we pick one of these. Or when I'm with my girlfriends having a girls' night or a wine night or whatever, we'll pick one of those movies. They're a crowd pleaser, for sure. And I think, I think these movies are just so iconic because it really found its stride in this genre in the early 2000s and then just kind of lost it. <laughs> I mean, I, I researched this and I definitely agree with this. There was a lot of rom-com fatigue after the early 2000s. Like, we had gotten like three decades of romantic comedies. And I think today we have just more varying interests. And romantic comedies are harder to come by, I guess. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So, like I said, <laughs> it's the same plot if you really think about it. It's like horror movies. There's a, there's a formula. And so you can apply this formula to every single rom-com and it all makes sense. Um, the protagonist, a woman or women, is finding her way through life as she meets a guy, falls in love, gives up, and then ends up happily ever after with him. So like think how to lose a guy in 10 days, right? So she it meets this guy, she falls in love, and she's kind of conning him. And so she feels really guilty because she does fall in love with him, but you know can't really get her way out of the mess she made. So then she decides to run away, leave New York, and go do something else in Chicago, like get a new job in Chicago. And Matthew McConaughey is speeding down like the Brooklyn Bridge after her on his motorcycle, following her cab, and then is like pull over, confesses his love, they kiss, and they live happily ever after. Like think about how many times that happens. Now I would say like, also with just like romantic comedy fatigue, I think a lot of people are viewing romantic comedies as kind of problematic now. I mean, if you think about it, it's easy to hypothesize that audiences got tired of romantic comedies because of things like gender politics, heteronormativity, general whiteness in these films. And now that doesn't really reflect our current society and our current progressive state of how we view our society and how we view love, romance, relationships, um, heteronormativity, kind of what what's the standard. And these changes are kind of seen in, in the most recent modern rom-coms like Crazy Rich Asians, Love, Simon, to All the Boys I've Loved Before. We're seeing a lot more diversity and minority and just kind of and just kind of general inclusivity. But like I said, it's not like people are, you know, cranking out all of these romantic comedies. There's kind of really only a few that are popular now. And I think part of that is just because, you know, like I said, it, the fatigue and just having it all be kind of the same thing, it can get a little monotonous, I think. But again, these films are great. Like there's no criticism I have for these films. I really, really liked them. But again, it's just not the same. It's not the same as like, think Mean Girls. It's so iconic. No one would say that Mean Girls isn't iconic. I mean, it basically like raised my generation. So I think it's just different. And I that's why I kind of wanted to talk about Y2K rom-coms specifically because they're, you, they really can't be beaten. I mean, I watched Something Borrowed the other day, which I believe is was released in 2006 because I was reading the sequel, Something Blue, and it was really good. I would highly recommend both. But I was like, they just don't make movies like this anymore. They don't make romantic comedies like this anymore. It's not the same. It's just not the same. And like the blackberries and the fashion and the bags and the hair and everything. It's just, it's iconic. Um, for Mean Girls though, it was considered very accurate to how everyday teenagers lived. Um, this is based on a Screen Rant article. And these are kind of the reasons why. There's about 10. So Mean Girls was considered accurate because um, of the theme of desperately wanting to be part of the cool crowd that is self-explanatory confusion about dating like who you are who you want to be with um, kind of where you stand in that relationship um, feeling insecure all the time I mean there's that one scene where they're like talking about how big their pores are and Lindsay Lohan's like I have bad breath in the morning like always insecure that's such a teenage staple and I think maybe this movie takes it to kind of like like one notch up a bit more than accurate, more than most teenagers. But 
you know, that was for that was for the drama. Okay, that was for the plot. A mean girl slash queen bee who bullies everyone. Again, self-explanatory. We all had one. We all had to deal with one. Realizing everyone has more in common than they thought, right? So you're like, you can be in these cliques. It can be hard to like jump from group to group to have like different facets of your personality with different facets of different groups. All of that jazz and just that confusion. But then, you know, finding finding your people, especially if you're like in high school and then you go to college and you're like, wow, I don't have to just like be this one side of myself. I can be multifaceted. That's what we strive for. Um, worrying about physical appearances, food, and body image. Amen. Especially women. I know guys do it, but as a woman, like, being a teenager and, like, going through puberty and then just being sexualized at a young age before I even, like, understood my own body, it was, it's just, it gets, it gets to be a lot. Spending a lot of time on the phone. <laughs> yep. Um, hiding real interests, so you, like, seem cool, fit in, whatever. Shifting social alliances, jumping from group to group, and then, this one's kind of random, but Halloween and other parties are a big deal. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, the proposal. I can watch it a million times and never get bored. That's how you know it's a good movie. It's like a comfort movie. Feeds my soul. Not my brain, but my soul. Watch it every, like, over and over and over and I love it. Laugh every time. So this one was also kind of iconic for the time because the plot was relatively unique compared to movies around the same time. So although it like kind of went back to like an old rom-com style or theme, I guess, it was definitely unique for the other movies in the early 2000s and even the 90s. The cast was a big sell to have Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds. And there's just no way that this film will end well. And we all knew it. Like right from the beginning, this like when she devised this plot, like, we all knew it was going to crash and burn, but we just didn't know how, and that's kind of where the comedy comes into the romance, and obviously the ultimate, like, romance at the end is really satisfying, I think, to see, but the comedy is just laced throughout it, which I think makes it pop a little bit. <laughs> also, Roger Ebert is, like, my favorite critic ever. I hope I'm saying his name right. He's just so honest. And he like simplifies things, but also goes into detail in a way that you can actually understand everything that he's saying. And I really like it. He said that as he watched the proposal, he watched the characters soften towards each other. And when he saw this, he began to soften. And that somewhat allowed him to root for their inevitable coupling. And he said that that was really unique, that he genuinely felt an emotional pull to the story and to the characters. Which I, I agree with, you know? I think we all want them to be together in the end. And that's kind of the hallmark of a great rom-com. Um, Freaky Friday, one of my childhood icons and celebrity crushes. Icon being Lindsay Lohan and Chad Michael Murray being the crush. I can still rock out to the songs in this film all day. Any day, every day, just put it on my Spotify. Um, it came out in 2003 and this film really dove into the parent-teenager dynamic, which is what made it so iconic and memorable in the early 2000s in America and I think like although teens had become rebellious for a long time before this I think the era of like Y2K created an outwardly dramatic and disrespectful aspect of teenagers attitudes and and their personalities and how they related to their parents and I think I think this was just kind of a different shift I think maybe it's it's interesting because in the film they put themselves in each other's shoes literally and so I think the whole message is to like teach kids and parents to, to kind of relate more, not separate themselves so much. And I liked that. But this film really represented like the parent versus child. Um, and in this film, like mom versus daughter dynamic. And I think it, I mean, partially was reflecting society at the time. I think that was the new version of rebellion that teenagers had. Legally Blonde. It is not my favorite rom-com. I will say that. But it is a classic and I will always watch it. Like if someone's like, I really want to watch Legally Blonde. I'm not, I'm never going to say no. Elle Woods saying what? Like it's hard about Harvard Law School. Like kills me every time. It's, ugh. We love a queen. We stand a queen. It came out in 2001. It glamorized extreme femininity, but not in a bad way. It was in more of a, if this is what you like, then don't apologize for it kind of way. In a be who you are. Challenge yourself and try new things, but stick, like stay true to your values and your morals and like know your worth 
And I think the overarching message is really like know your worth, know who you are, and don't be ashamed of it. Um, which I think is really iconic. And like we love a girl that like rejects the crappy whole ex boyfriend, which she does. And a walk to remember, like I said, I don't, I don't know if I consider this a rom com or just like a romance film, but it was the first romance movie I ever cried to. Um, the Notebook was second, but I watched A Walk to Remember first. It made me really emotional, and it definitely sends the message that, like, a girl can change or, like, fix a guy, especially, like, a jerk one. Like, the bad boy, she can fix him, change him, like, all because she loves him or she's gentle with him or, like, patient with him and no one else is. Like, to me, that's a very toxic idea that we've been taught since we were young, us women, that we just have to take a man's and like fix him or just love him until he changes and becomes a good person and it just doesn't work and it's not healthy and it's toxic and it's it's just not worth believing in not worth the time not worth trying to do that it's just not worth it but this movie is really sweet in the end the girl meets the guy he changes for her they fall in love and it's really sweet very very romantic I'm just going to pose one more question. I know I've, you know, just kind of rambled on and talked about a lot, but I kind of wanted to ask the question, why do romantic comedies matter? You know, like we talk about the love and reflecting society and how, you know, love and dating is like very much a part of our society and our generations and they're, you know, different each generation and how romantic comedies have kind of come about. But I think, I think it really celebrates love for us and those around us as a society in your you know friend group or your partnership or your relationships or your family etc it also serves as an important reminder that love does not define your personal value so like no matter what happens in these films and in the end love doesn't conquer all and like just wanting to be with someone doesn't define you it doesn't define them it doesn't determine like your value your worth your life's worth your life's purpose success failure, all of that, I think is wrapped up in these films. Now, whether or not the film actually tells you that you are worthy on your own, that's kind of a different story. They could very well tell you the opposite. But then I think also saying that love is all that matters can also, again, remind you that your value is not just in love, because I think it's easy to see this film and kind of be swept away with all these, you know, romance notions but then to come back, come back to your life and our life as a society, you can still come away with this message that you are like amazing as an individual and you don't need someone to love you to be loved or to feel lovable. Wow, that just got really deep, really fast. Whew. But you know what, you guys? It's late. And like I said, I had a margarita. So I just hope you guys could follow along and enjoy what I'm talking about. I know this was kind of quick, but like I said, I couldn't just pick one, one film to discuss. So I talked about them all <laughs> as per usual, but I hope you guys like this episode and please reach out to me on any of my platforms. If you have any questions or comments or concerns, I would love to hear your feedback. would love to hear your thoughts. would love to interact with you guys. So thank you guys for listening and for waiting patiently for this episode to come out. I know I procrastinated it. I'm sorry. A lot going on, but I'm really glad that I got to sit down and make this and I hope you enjoyed it. I will talk to you guys next week. Bye. Now if you run into a fine but you covered with fur Diamond rings and all those things Bet your life it isn't her Could she love, could she woo, could she, 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 could